what's the motivation? Well, uh, we're starting out with one of the, one of the big factors uh, uh, in finance, uh, the size factor. Going back to bonds, we have this result that small uh, caps beat larger caps, and uh, it's not accounted for by market beta or by the simple cap M. Uh, it's used all over the place. Some of these are overlapping, of course. It's, it's one of the focal points in the discussion of market efficiency. Why does this occur? What are the possible reasons? Uh, it's, uh, it's in the famous Fama French three factor, or the French Fama French Carhartt four factor. I usually don't call it French Carhartt, but you know, right here. Um, being careful. Um, but it's, it's ubiquitously used uh, for evaluating other studies, for performance attribution. Uh, it has the direct implication that small firms should face larger costs of capital than large firms. Uh, and it quite clearly, right, wrong, or indifferent, affects the investment management world. There are lots of small cap funds and allocations to small cap that are driven by this. So it, 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 it behooves us to look at it. It's an inherently interesting topic to our field. Starting out with seven criticisms of the size anomaly, and I'll try to do these quick. Uh, it has a relatively weak historical record, particularly compared to some of the other biggies that, that, that we study. Value, momentum, uh, you'll hear about carry later today. Uh, Risk-adjusted, sharp ratio, uh, alpha against factor models. Uh, size is not one of the stronger ones. It varies significantly over time. Uh, of course, being weaker means it's going to vary more over time. There are going to be longer stretches where it doesn't work if you're weaker. I don't want to, some of this again is double counting if the mean is lower. Uh, but in particular, in particular, it took a hit by suffering a rather long drought relatively soon after it was discovered. It actually somewhat recovered uh, since then, uh, but nothing uh, will, will, will be a bigger PR hit than having a long drought relatively near after discovery, and we'll address that. It appears to be driven in its, in its classic form by relatively extreme stocks, uh, and there are different forms of this. In some studies, it seems to be all micro-cap stocks. In other, it appears to be all big-cap stocks being lousy against everything else being kind of uh, more mediocre. A lot of that depends on what kind of risk adjustment you do. But in almost no case do we see a nice, smooth relation between size. Uh, and, and, and return. Well, we see some odd-looking relations, and that kind of doesn't have to, it's not damning in and of itself, but it's, it's bothersome. Uh, another thing that's not damning in and of itself is it occurs predominantly in January, in fact, entirely uh, in, in January. Uh, that doesn't have to, again, be damning for, for a factor. Uh, it's pretty hard to trade in and out um, and make money on doing it only in January. Small caps aren't that cheap to to, to, to trade, and nothing uh, in the literature says you should get this all the time or it's not going to be lumpy across months. But I still think most of us in this room would feel more comfortable with the factor that all else equal look kind of randomly distributed across the months, as opposed to all coming in one month and not in the other. So again, not damning into a, in and of itself, but a characteristic that maybe makes us uh, feel a, a, a little less comfortable with it. Uh, this is the Jonathan Burke uh, critique, uh, that it's really a, a manifestation in, in, uh, of the value effect, because in size is price. Uh, and if you do measures of size that are unconnected to price, uh, you get a much weaker size effect, and we'll address that. It's, uh, another one is it's not a size, it's a liquidity effect. Uh, and we will talk about that. And then finally, uh, it is weaker outside of the US. Uh, so weaker after you discovered it and weaker outside of the US are two forms of, of if not failing, not wildly succeeding in an out-of-sample test. And certainly along with Cam's talk, on, I'm very conscious going after him and thinking about data mining. Uh, these would be two things that would worry you. We define quality, and we will define it our favorite way which we know is not everyone's favorite way, so I'll also d define it a lot simpler than our favorite way. Quality is essentially uh, anything that you would rationally, all else equal, pay more for. So uh, all else equal, if, if a stock's going to forever grow more than another stock, and I'm, of course, making up extreme example, any, anyone rational would pay more.
for, for that. And we can get into, and everyone can have a different opinion on what you should pay more for or not. We've taken our, our, our chance, our shot at this, but it's things you should pay more for. Uh, we find this, uh, this, this if, uh, anom semi-anomalous result still being fought over that these measures almost ubiquitously, the higher quality tends to outperform the lower quality, which is a, a little bit of a puzzle. Uh, and then the simple welding these two together, small firms, probably not surprisingly, tend to be low quality, what we call junk, and that hurts their performance. If high quality wins, being junk hurts. Uh, and I, I think it is surprising how ubiquitous it is, how any way you want to define quality, any way we've come up with, um, even some that are returns based, uh, some that, that are balance sheet based, some that are some, some that, are, that, that are completely different. Uh, small is junky to large, and junk loses. When you adjust for that, if you create, for instance, a small that is neutral to quality, that is a far more powerful small firm. If it's a pure, we would call that a pure small firm effect, one that is not taking a tilt on junk, and it's much stronger. And the rest of the paper is trying to show that to you and trying to uh, see how many of the puzzles uh, uh, about small we can solve with this one observation. So summary of the results. Uh, essentially, uh, the period we use most often, and there are lots of different uh, time periods because not every variable is, is available over the same, uh, but uh, 1957 to 2012, uh, roughly 55 years, uh, is our base period. That's when we have our quality minus junk factor that I'm going to describe in a minute. And over that period, against um, a, a, a four-factor model, it's not the most famous four-factor model, it actually doesn't have small cap on the right because uh, I, I, you know, there are better academics than me in the room, but if you have small cap factor on the left and on the right, it's a pretty boring regression. Um, but as a fourth factor, we put in a market lag because small can be relatively illiquid and that lag does come in and it's been around for a long time. Um, uh, 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 Scholes, William, Dimson looked at this and it matters a little bit, changes things a drop, it wouldn't change the whole study. Uh, but it adjusts for, for, for uh, beta value and momentum exposure. It doesn't matter. In the paper, we show different factor models. This is not the big deal in the paper, what factor model you put on the right. Uh, essentially, it approximately, by a factor of three to four, raises the annualized intercept and the t-statistic if you create a small cap factor that is not long junk, that is simply neutral. The junk, and that's the kind of the money shot of the paper. Uh, these correspond exactly. I said there were seven criticisms of of small cap. I will save a little time by saying two through seven here are yet yeah, no, 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 no. We disagree. No, yeah, um, we, we we think what we've done either fixes or ameliorates all seven of those. So I won't read them all to you, but they're the precise analogs of what we call the seven problems. So what am I going to do? I'm going to define what, what, uh, the, how we define quality and the tests we're going to run. I'm going to show you the evidence, um, and, and then I'm going to conclude. Uh, again, first I'm going to take you through how we define quality, and not surprisingly, as most authors do, we choose our own definitely We've written a paper on quality, so we choose ours. Um, I promise you, if you don't like ours, uh, and I can debate both sides of ours, ours is a very inclusive measure that tries to be very kitchen sink uh, about including a whole bunch of things for for, for, for each to capture all uh, elements, uh, probably more susceptible to data mining, and I'm going to be saying that oh, just because just I can, I'm going to be saying that more and more than I, than I normally would because I'm hypersensitive. But we show some very simple one variable measures too uh, later on. Uh, so if you love ours, great, and if you don't love ours, we got others for you. But what we basically do is we start out with the Gordon growth model, uh, do some fairly uh, uh, simplistic math just to rearrange it. And think of, the, think of price to book. And we got some of our, and, and we motivate our paper with this, we got some of our motivation from John Cochran's AFA presidential speech, where he talked about we're all focused on returns, we should be trying to explain prices. How do prices vary? Uh, it turns out we explain them a little in this paper. We're still working on it. We'd like to explain them more in this original QMJ paper. But how do you explain price to book? Well, we have these four things on the right. All else equal, and that's very important. These are all partial derivative concepts. All else equal, if you cannot change the other ones, a more profitable firm gets you a higher price to book. 
a firm that pays out more if they're able to have the same profitability and growth. Gets you more if you have more current carry and nothing else changes, that's good. If you require a lower return, whatever your equilibrium risk model might be, if you require less return, price is higher. And if you grow faster, you, you, you pay a higher price. For each one of these, we do not try to define one precise measure, and this is the catch-all nature. And again, we will, for robustness purposes, use some far more simple, less catch-all single measures on, in our tables also. For profitability, you can read them there. We survey the literature and we use uh, a large swath of what other people have used to measure profitability. Uh, gross, uh, gross profitability, the Novi Marx type factor being maybe the most canonical example here. Growth, uh, we were real simple. We didn't try to get cued here too. We looked at what we used for profitability and we said uh, that's, that's what people want. So growth is prior five year change in the exact same things we used in profitability. Required return, uh, we're all still fighting about the right equilibrium model for, for required return. So we use a bunch of both statistical and, and fundamental measures of what you might be either, either from, from hardcore closed form models or from just intuition think are related to risk and required return. On the, re on the return side, we use things like beta, of course, the betting against beta factor of, of, of two of my co-authors. Um, volatility itself, idiosyncratic volatility. On the fundamentals, we use things like low leverage uh, and, and a few other fundamental measures. And finally, payout, um, we use a few things. We use the actual five-year uh, uh, payouts of the firms, and then we use some issuance variables um, in terms of uh, if they can return cash any way they can do it to investors without affecting the others, it's a positive. So let's jump right in with the first results. Uh, upper left, SMB is Fama French factor. Uh, just, uh, it, like all of us, I will use the phrase in my presentation from Ken French's website. T statistics for over the, what we call the full period, uh, uh, two, uh, we ended in 2012, we could extend it, wouldn't change much. Uh, from 1926 to the present, the SMB itself with no risk adjustment gets a 2.27. Uh, Cam Harvey somewhere is not pleased, I don't know where he's sitting, but we did not get to the magic three. Um, now, some of that's out of sample, some of that's in sample, but we're nowhere near the magic three. The right adjusts for my adjusted four-factor model. Remember that it's the regular four-factor model dropping SMB because you can't explain it, or else you shouldn't explain it with itself, but adding a leg to the market. And there you're at a T-stat of, of 0.48, with most of that being the market beta. Its value and its momentum exposures don't explain much. Its market beta over this period cuts it to a 0.48. And if you weren't excited about a 2.27, um, I, I don't think you even need Cam Harvey in the room not to be excited about a 0.48 uh, near 100 year T statistic. Then this will repeat itself. Uh, we always show January and non-January. Uh, again, how relevant this is, you can decide. But yeah, if you only did it in January, it's only a two with risk adjustment, even in January, but it's a six. Uh, 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 in non-January. And then we have a few different periods. QMJ sample is going to be our most important. That's when we have all the things we want, 1957 to the present. Uh, and then we have a few others that we've came up with, we think cute names for. The Golden Age was just a strong period for small and a, and a period that heavily influenced, I think, the discovery of small. We tend to discover things after Golden Ages. Again, if there's a blend between my presentation and Cam's, it's, it's, it wasn't intentional, it just happened. I sat there. Uh, the embarrassment period was the decade kind of after the discovery when small was weak. And then we were probably over embarrassed. Just like we were over excited, we were probably over embarrassed by that because then there was a, uh, a resurrection period where it did quite, quite, quite better. Uh, it's kind of fun because the fun is going to be later when we see these numbers be a lot more uniform and, uh, and jump around a lot less uh, when we adjust for quality. On the right, again, risk adjusted, all much weaker. Full period much weaker, the QMJ, you get just over, 1.23 is gonna show up again and again, it's kind of our straw man we compare to. 1.23 T stat over 50 some odd years is, is gonna get no one excited. The January one does not break one over 50 some odd years. Uh, it breaks two over 100 some odd years, or not quite 100, but uh, nine, getting near 90. Uh, and is negative now over the embarrassment period. So we got some ways to go to resurrect this.
This is probably the most important table. The top line, nothing to do, we've not added quality yet. The top line is a regression over this QMJ period, 1957 to 2012. Just chosen because that's when we have all the stuff we need to build our quality factor for. And I should have, uh, QMJ is an equally weighted average, by the way, I, I think I skipped saying it, of those four things. Profitability, payout, required return, uh, and growth. So it's a pan quality measure. Um, over that period, without quality in the regression, you get that 1.23 T stat on the left for the alpha. You get market exposure currently, 0.17 beta. You get a lag beta of 0.13. Why do you get that? For the same old reason a lot of us have studied, not every small stock trades every month. So one lag comes in, and of course other lags come in much smaller, or we would have included them. Um, not tremendous amounts. Uh, you, do get, you do get some uh, 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 numbers on, the, on value and momentum. You get a negative uh, on value, actually, which surprises some people. Surprise me. Check that number of times. Doesn't change the end results very much. Uh, and you get nothing. Again, the alpha is nothing. Uh, the most important line in the whole paper, everything else I do will be either using this to explain other problems with the small cap effect or robustness checks that I didn't go too far with QMJ using simpler versions. The most important line in the whole paper is the next regression. Put in this QMJ factor, what do you get? You get a massive negative loading, uh, a negative, uh, point, uh, negative 15 T stat. We are pretty small, sure small firms are junky. And you get this tripling to quadrupling of both the intercepts economic and statistical power. If, and this is an if, you accept that QMJ is a reasonable factor. A neutral small cap, a small cap that is neither quality nor junk. It's not quality, it's just neutral to it. You get a strong small cap effect. The pure small tilt, not tilting towards junk or value or momentum or the market, is very strong. It's, it's, it's Cam Harvey strong. You, you've heard of wristbands. I want a wristband that says Cam Harvey strong. Not only that, it's, it's much steadier across these three other periods, from golden age to embarrassment to resurrection. They're all three or four T-stats. Uh, and they're different length periods, which makes it a little weird that I'm excited about T-stats that are roughly the same, because you know they're not supposed to be over different length periods. Uh, but even over the so-called embarrassment period, you get up to a three T-stat over a short 10-year period. Uh, so this really matters. At the bottom, we, we do our first of, of many robustness checks. We take those four parts of QMJ, they're just four long short portfolios. Long profitable, short non-profitable, long high growth, short low growth, long high payout, short low payout, long low required return, short high required return. And we do them separately, same, same four parts of QMJ. All four small loads neg significantly negatively on all four. The weakest by a healthy margin is on growth, and it's still statistically pretty strong. So small is not just junky, it's junky on every way we can come up with to measure quality versus junk. And the intercept goes up fairly dramatically on all four, with again, not surprising because it was the weakest, it was the weakest contemporaneous relationship. It goes up the least for growth, but it grows, goes up for all of them, and for three of the individuals, not pooling them. Treating them as just, just adjusting for, for profitability, just adjusting for risk or required return, just adjusting for payout. You get to a significant uh, more than three T stat, uh, a triple, uh, the, the non risk adjusted, non quality adjusted size results. So you do not need to lump these all into one. It's not a magic effect you get from having tons of different things going on. Second, it holds for all of them. So any, any way, and I, I'd love you to come up with other ones, I'd love to test them. Any way we've come up that feels like a reasonably intuitive measure of junk versus quality has, has been this direction. Now we're in robustness check land. Let's say uh, half the room thought QMJ was fairly reasonable, half the room thought we, th we, we have too much going on in there. I want to see, I want to see it a little cleaner. Um, well, here are two, and the next page will have some others. Here are two. Let's take one part of one of the four parts of QMJ, the betting against beta factor of Frazzini and Peterson, two of my co-authors. So it's one part of one of the four. 
Um, that is uh, B. And if you, again, you see that famous 1.23 T-stat uh, uh, w- without any quality in the regression. Uh, very, very weak. S- uh, SMB, size minus, uh, small minus big, is only a 1.23 T-stat over this period. If you just add betting against beta, you double the T-stat, and you almost double the economic intercept. Uh, you don't get to Cam Harvey levels with just one part of one of the four. Uh, but going from 1.23 to, 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 to a 2.42 with one, one of the things we're looking at, you've got to think there are more dimensions. Even if you don't like ours, you've got to think there are more dimensions to quality than just beta. Just beta gets you a fair amount of the way there. Um, the other ones are, are over some sub-periods, looking at different things. My favorite is the final one, um, which is 87 to the present. It's 87 to the present, which, by the way, I, I, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this. I first looked at it and said, oh, God, it's a pretty short period. Can we really show 87 to the present? And then I went back and I looked at some of my Fama French stuff that was 63 to 88 in the first test. And I felt better about 87 to the, to, to the present. Um, it's, uh, it's at least on a par. I also, at, at my own firm, all, people often show me results 1990 to the present. I don't know why. Um, my dissertation data started in the late 80s, and by the time I was done, I added up to 1990. And when I say, how about pre-1990, they go, that's really old data. And I'm like, yeah, that was my entire dissertation. We, we didn't think it was old data back then. You feel really old when people call it old. Look at the bottom. It's not that 1.23 because it's over a different period, but the first line of the bottom panel shows a 0.27, I believe. Yeah, 0.27 T stat. So nothing for small minus big after risk adjustment over this uh, uh, you know near 30 year period. If you just put in credit, a new variable, and I'll explain what it is in a second, you get over a T stat, over two T stat with the right negative. What is credit? All stocks. We're not actually trading bonds here in any way. It's long A rated or better firms and short C rated or worse firms. Like all these quality measures, you might have first thought, gee, you'll lose money on that because why should you make money on long the safer? And like all these quality measures, you get this perverse result that it actually has a positive mean. Small, not surprisingly, is more junky, again, than it is high credit quality, and it's short a positive mean, so its intercept goes up. And then at the bottom, we just put that and the BAB factor in, and doesn't change much at all. Now let's go to Fama French. You could argue that their five-factor model, which I think both Mark and I would agree on this, should be a six-factor model, but that's an entirely separate story. It doesn't have momentum, come on. They introduced two factors to their classic three-factor model, profitability, uh, very akin to the Novi Marks definition of profitability, and an investment uh, factor where where the idea is overinvestment is bad. So less investment is good. That is very akin to payout. It's not perfectly payout, but if you invest less, you you tend to pay out more. They're very correlated factors. Uh, But they're not groups of factors. They're not like what I was doing before. They're single factors. You see the first line? Uh, Fama French period, I have an all new period for you to look over, 63 to the present, the famous uh, uh, July of 63 that so many of us have started uh, regressions over. Um, and uh, I think we're at a one something T stat uh, over that. Over this period, uh, 1.31, again, very weak for small after risk adjustment. Uh, if you add in just the two Fama French factors, you get near a three T stat. Um, most of it from profitability, uh, though their investment factor is going the right direction. It's weak, but the right direction. Uh, if you start throwing in other things, like our QMJ, well, that knocks it out, but it's not surprising. I will certainly admit, whether we're right or data mined, it's a richer, broader set than just two. Um, and if you throw in betting against beta, it gets even stronger, knocks out their investment factor. But betting against beta, single factor, and Fahman French or Novi Marx's profitability gets you almost all the way there. You don't need our complex QMJ. It's our favorite, but you don't need it. Finally, at the bottom, we create a single factor um, of of the non-QMJ parts. Okay, so what are those? The two Fama French, profitability and investment, the credit factor, and betting against beta. So not not an aggregation of everything, just of those four, so simple representatives of all the quadrants, 
We don't have them all. In the beginning, in, in 57, we only have betting and spade. In 63, we get the Fama French factors. In 87, we get the credit factors. It's always an equally weighted average, so it is slightly changing through time. Gets you almost all the way there. That's QMJ. You don't, that, QMJ has something like 30 factors in it. Um, you, we can have a separate, I love it. You might not like it. You might be cynical about 30 factors. You don't need them. You need three or four to get to the result. In fact, if you put both it and QMJ, it wants some of both. There's really you know, almost no version of quality you could put on the right and not find a significant increase in the, in the intercept and a significant negative loading for size. This is in sample, so always take in sample with, a, with, with at least a grain, maybe not two grains, but a grain of salt. Um, the gray line is if you hedged SMB with just the four-factor risk model, the one I'm using. The, the black line is the cumulative returns on SMB if you hedged it with that in quality. Yes, the simple language here is quality has a positive mean and SMB is short quality, so it goes up more. Uh, but it's always interesting to see the periods. Uh, there is a flat period, uh, close to 10 years. Can't fix that, not selling an arbitrage. Uh, it still, it, it gets a lot better, but it doesn't turn into a four sharp ratio. Uh, I think we've all learned to be leery of four sharp ratios, no? Um, but much, much better. Just a graphic way. Something you didn't need to see probably, but just to show you that uh, small is far junkier than large. Uh, large has very few junky stocks. Small has a tremendous amount of them. In every industry we look at with our st standard industry classification, small is negatively correlated to, to, to quality junk within that industry. And within every one, quality beats junk. So within every one, the alpha of size within the industry gets better. You don't see a lot, I don't know if it's quite 50, it might be, uh, it's around, you don't see a lot of 50 for 50s, even with a strong result. Uh, January is a fun one. I will only focus on the two bars in the upper left. So two bars out of like 40. These are the non-January results. The blue bars are if one only adjusts for the four-factor model. You don't make money outside of January. The orange bars, and it is statistically significant, we don't show the T stats here, is if you also adjust for QMJ. If you adjust for QMJ, it is significant in all months. If you also, it, there is still a January seasonal. Adjusting for QMJ, it's still stronger in January, but even that is only about half the size. So again, I'm not sure January is a disaster for a factor, but I think we all intuitively feel better when it's smoother. This both works outside of January and is a far smaller difference between January and other months. Globally, if you'd like, of course you always check globally. In every country except freaking Ireland, there's always one, size uh, is uh, small as low quality. Apparently in Ireland, small stocks are jewels. In every country except Ireland, uh, the, uh, the intercept, the same things I've been showing you, the intercept with and without quality, the intercept gets from between a little to a lot stronger. Obviously across countries, and some of them being quite small, you get a, a pattern of strength. Uh, but if you add these up and, and average them, it's dramatic. You have one tiny negative. So it's very robust around the world. This is not a US phenomenon. Extremes, it's not just about the extremes. Uh, if you look, uh, ignore the bottom, that's just looking over the golden age. If you look over the QMJ, our longest sample period, we have everything. The uh, blue lines are adjusted for only the cap M. The red lines are adjusted for our four-factor model. In both of those, it is, a, it is about the extremes. It's mainly about big stinking. And maybe micro being a little better than everything else, but very flat within that. Again, not damning, but not what you want to see. If you adjust for QMJ, adjust for quality, the small cap is beautifully linear. I don't insist on a linear relationship, but I do prefer one. It intuitively resonates with me more. Size is very linearly related to the alphas from the, from the five-factor model, four-factor plus QMJ. So that criticism goes away. Uh, liquidity, I will do super quick. Liquidity, actually, and there probably a bunch of people know more about uh, this in the room than I do, uh, only fixes a little of the small firm effect. Um, it reduces it a bit when you put in liquidity proxies. That could easily be that we don't have the right liquidity proxies. I've long thought liquidity is one of the few reasonable explanations for the small firm effect. 
not many other great explanations for it being risk outside, outside of that to me. But liquidity has always been one. It affects some of it. QMJ still, liquidity reduces it a bit. QMJ brings it way back. Uh, quality, uh, it restores the small firm effect, even if you put it on an equal liquidity footing. If we ever come up with the granddaddy of all liquidity measures that knocks out small even more, we'll have to see if QMJ can resurrect that, but we're not, we're not there yet. It resurrects any liquidity measures we've seen. So conclusions, um, real simple paper. Quality measured in almost any way, oh, actually any, any way I've seen, um, I'll say almost to be careful, in almost any way, higher quality beats lower quality, which is itself a weird result and something perhaps to argue about another day. Small is long, lousy quality or junk, short, high quality in every way we've come up to measure quality. And not surprisingly, given those two, and we all know how regressions work, if you're negatively exposed to a positive mean factor, your intercept goes up. And it goes up a lot, and it goes up to economically and statistically quite powerful numbers. And those other seven things, some of which I admit are merely consequences of the intercept going up. It's kind of like if you tell me the, the, the mean went up and then you tell me, and it wins more frequently. These are not independent observations. But things like it being far more linear between deciles, things like the January versus non-January differential being smaller, that did not have to happen just from the mean going up. So that is a somewhat independent observation. And finally, um, two interpretations that I will share with you, and this is, these are wide open, you guys can agree or disagree. Uh, we think we, we've made theoreticians' problems worse. For one thing, I, I, I said, I slipped in earlier that I, I think among our different factors are our theoretical stories outside of liquidity, which doesn't seem to explain that much, but theoretically liquidity would have been a beautiful story if it explained the small cap effect. I don't think we have great theoretical stories for it. And we came along, and if you believe our results, we just made the effect much stronger. So now we don't have stories explaining a much stronger result. Not only that, if you're trying to tell some kind of risk story, we eliminated the scarier part of small, and it got better. We didn't eliminate the, the, the fun part of small. We, we eliminated the part that, that if you're looking for a risk story, might be where you'd start. So it, it's a hard one. It's a hard one. We've laid down, um, if, if, there's, if, if we haven't done something majorly wrong, we've made the problem of how good small caps are worse for the industry, not better. Um, finally, to end on a mildly sobering note to anyone rushing out to call their broker, um, I'm optimistic about this. You know, this is what I do for a living. I hope we can make some money from this. Uh, but it's not certain yet. Uh, small caps are expensive to trade. The quality, um, uh, it doesn't have the turnover of momentum, uh, but it's not as slow as value. Some of those quality measures actually turn over pretty reasonably. So I'm not here to tell you that we will guarantee you after trading costs and after whatever fees are charged, this makes money. We are hopeful about that. I'm not cynical about that. My own firm, as you can imagine, is in the midst of trying to figure this out. Some of you can too, but that is not a claim I'm making yet. Uh, I might make that claim at some point, but, but as of now, uh, I think it's a very strong gross of return effect. That is important whether it can be implemented or not. It helps explain the cross-section of returns. Open question about whether people you know, that small question at the end, can we actually make money uh, on this? That is, that is still open. And as you can imagine, I have some interest in that answer. You know, just latching on something that both, both of you guys said about the, the genesis of why this premium is sustainable. So Mark was saying we shouldn't worry too much about the stories. And as an investment manager, it is what we care about is the sustainability. So if you think about some of the other known factors or anomalies, whatever you want to call them, value, selling ball, there's, there's a deep, the reason why the story is kind of interesting for people like us is you worry about whether that's sustainable. So there's like selling vol, there's certainly you know, implications, either real or perceived, that would cause people not to go out and take that. And the same thing with value, there's, you know, sounds good in a cocktail party to have a, a cool story about an expensive stock, whereas value stocks tend to be beaten down, so it's hard to justify to your clients or your friends why you buy those stocks. The quality premiums in the opposite direction, right? Because you're saying all the good things that would play well, why you know a layperson or an investor or a consumer or anybody would like it. It has good profit margins. It's got good characteristics of the company, and you get a premium. So isn't it 
important or interesting to think that, you know, why that premium doesn't, especially as products are being offered in these factors, might go away in the future, whereas, you know, the selling vol premium might sustain, particularly if you get a few crashes that come up along the way. So I would just ask or argue that maybe the story is interesting in terms of trying to assess qualitatively what's going to happen in the future on this thing. I think on the spectrum, I'm in the direction of Mark. I'm probably a little less nihilistic on stories th than Mark. Um, and you can disagree with that. Um, but I also think it, it do does vary tremendously across factors. There are factors where I'm pretty comfortable with the story. You go back to, to value and the results, you know, go back to Ball's paper. Price divided by anything, it doesn't really matter what expected returns are. It should catch some of it. I, I kind of I kind of buy that. Um, size, I never had a good story for. I don't think anyone really, really, re really did. Momentum, I think, um, w while once you have a story, if you propose a story under reaction, um, you can then maybe do some other testable implications and try to, to drill into that story that are not to do with the returns, actually. Before the fact, again, if you had found the opposite sign, you, you, that's the data mining. Result. One of my favorite things about momentum is, is our two best stories in the literature are under and over reaction. There's something wrong with the literature. That two best stories are, and they, of course, can be consistent with each other, but when those are your two best stories, you're, you got a bit of a problem. The one thing I'd mention about the stories behind quality, there's one that I think we have a fairly clean story, and admittedly it's a story that people in my firm have been pushing for a while, the leverage aversion story behind betting against Beta. It's a Fisher Black story. It's really not ours. We just borrowed it from, from Fisher. Um, I think, I, without going into it, because it's in the interest of time, I think that's a strong story. One thing Mark pointed out, which is actually true, which I should have mentioned, is these quality factors are remarkably consistent in being fairly low beta. It is not just the betting against beta factor that is low beta. Therefore, if you like this story, it might apply to these others also. They, these are all intercepts in regressions. So they tell you you make risk adjusted returns. They don't tell you you make total returns. If you're a long short manager, you, don't, you never give a darn. Uh, but if you're trying to beat a long only benchmark, the low beta hurts. So that could be part, uh, the same leverage aversion that applies to low beta. And they're not all low beta, but as a group, they're extremely low beta. Could apply to the whole. So that's one possible reason. I'm also a fan of the paper, so I, I, I <laughs> uh -oh. like the paper. Um, but. And, and I, I'm not going to ask you how many uh, things you actually tried to get to that 15 components of, uh, of QMJ. What I'm interested in is not really in the paper. Um, suppose that you actually are working on taking something like this to market, and you have to relook at the composition. Uh, of the actual factor, what is the research protocol uh, at AQR that, uh, that you have in place because you've actually looked at the data, you've done the robustness, you've looked at different markets, so how much leeway do you actually have uh, and how does your research protocol guide you to go from this to a product that you can offer to investors? Okay, uh, in some ways it's, it's less and in some ways it's more data mine than what you see here. Um, the when you say what did we include, I think you'll find very little we didn't include, um, which is both a form of data mining and avoiding data mining. We did not go to most of the major papers out there and pick the best ones. Having said that, as Cam will tell you, the literature does the data mining for you. Um, so that effect we definitely have, but we then didn't cherry pick among them. And it's not that much more complicated than a, what I will now call a Carhartian approach of including most of these at modest weights. I wish I had a more ingenious answer in some people. I tend to be a seller of ideas um, like we have uh, an optimizer that will choose the exact right weights of these. I, I, I'd rather if we have 15 factors, one over 15 um, on each of them. It's not a crazy way to start. With that said, I hope with some intuition, which I'm starting to doubt myself, but certainly with the data too, here's where it got non, uh, less data mining in the, in, in the paper. We just did a quarter weight on each of these. Um, 
I would say, I hope before the fact, but I think truly growth probably has the weakest story. It's very slow moving. It's a five-year story. It doesn't even have a momentum flavor to it. That's pretty slow moving. We don't usually see momentum at five years. Um, and I can't think of an economic story for it. And it had the weakest results. I'm not above, maybe not zero, but giving it less weight when building that. So it's really, uh, if I, I can pretend this is science, it's much closer to art. Take the group. There are some, most of them you feel relatively similar about. Some you feel a little bit more strongly, some you feel a little less. That's a combination of both story and data. Um, some you could test out a sample better than others. There's more data to, to, to test on them. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter that much. As long as you have a broad set of them at reasonably non-concentrated weights, long, the, the, I'll be careful, the long-term results don't matter. Many of us have learned these short-term results can be dramatically different from relatively tiny tweaks. That's, that's one of the curses of this industry, how 2.9 correlated things can make you say, if only I had done that, I would have had a positive year uh, last year. That's just true. Uh, but 0.9 correlations do win out long term. Um, so long term, uh, as long as you're inclusive and not trying to get too cute, you can make it great if you're right or ruin it all if you're wrong. I think we'd be more likely to ruin it all if we got too cute. So much closer to the mark uh, methodology. What was the driving story behind the paper? Is it that the small cap didn't work? Uh, sort of, you know, along the lines with, with, with Cam's arguments. You know, how, how, how much did you do before you reached the result? That's, that's my question. We, we largely reached the result by accident. Uh, I'll tell you, the, if, if this answers your question, the precise way we did the result was we wrote QMJ. And at one point, we did the opposite regression in a paper. And at one point, one of us, who annoyingly wasn't me, I like it to be me, noticed that intercept get a lot better. Is that robust? And then we chased it. And we chased it down, and it turned out to be an extremely robust result everywhere, industries, countries, factor models. Um, but we did not set out tabula rasa and say, we must save the small firm effect. It's, it's up to us. Um, <laughs> we ran into it. And you know how, I, at least, um, I, it was independent. Jagadish and Tipman were about six months ahead of me, but I independently was looking at momentum in my dissertation. I was a PhD student, so I stuck in the prior 12 months and I said, let's see what happens. You're the first group of 500 people I've ever shared that with. So don't <laughs> tell anyone. Um, it, 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 that didn't have to be robust. The chances that I was wrong and J&T J and, and Mark were all wrong about momentum at that point with what we knew was actually, I don't think very large, but was non-trivial. Um, you could call that luck, that we all got lucky, that it became incredibly robust at a sample. Now, I, I think it's a little less luck in that we didn't try 8 million things. We said, oh, look, this saves SMB in the US. Let's try it globally, for instance. That was pure at a sample. So I think this is fairly clean, but it was, it was not a well thought out plan to begin with. It was uh, more work, it was more a path that led there. W one last question. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Pankaj. Quick question on the quality. You know, have you thought about or any comments on a junk rally like March 2009 through end of the year and similar in 2003 also happen? Um, yeah, it, the quality factors stink uh, during that. Did I promise you a factor that always works at some point <laughs> in this presentation? <laughs> because sometimes my lawyers get mad. I slip in, we guarantee it into <laughs> client presentations. <laughs> And that causes all kinds of problems. Um, this is very tied in with, uh, with momentum during horribly in March, um, April, and May of, of 2009. People have written papers on other forms of momentum that have held up better. Um, uh, we've written stuff observing that if you just were combining it with, with, with up-to-date value, the combination wasn't that it was a bad period, but it wasn't that bad at all, which we've always recommended not to do pure momentum. So I've never sweated that so much. Um, but quality, as you can imagine, was a flight to quality during the, the global financial crisis. Uh, and it wasn't as pure as momentum, so it's pain in that spring reversal you're talking about. 
wasn't as bad as momentum, but it was directionally very similar. It was stuff that had done well in the GFC, doing very poorly when the world very short and sharp turned around. And I, I don't think, unlike momentum where there's some evidence, and whenever you talk about uh, is this a negatively skewed left tail factor, um, you have a few data points and there always might be a right tail you've never seen, right? It's the problem with analyzing lotteries. But with the data we have, momentum does seem to have a left tail. Uh, the, the QMJ seems to be a fairly symmetric factor, but uh, I, I can't do better than just by definition. You're right. If I, if I say my factor's quality minus junk, and you say your factor did lousy in a junk rally, I'm going to go, yeah. 